My name is Dennis Prescott, uh, sometimes known as Dennis the Prescott, if you look at me online. Uh, but I'm a cook, cookbook author, food photographer, uh, and uh, I kind of get to travel all over and cook with folks and take photographs, uh, recipe write, and uh, ultimately inspire people uh, to move kind of from the couch to the kitchen and then ultimately to spend more time at the table. So the earliest flavor memory I have was with my dad. We were driving in an MGB convertible. We were driving up to see my grandmother. She lives in northern New Brunswick, top down, beautiful July day. And we stopped at a diner and got a flat top cooked hamburger. I was probably six. And it was the first diner hamburger, french fries, chocolate milkshake, classic as it could possibly be, dinner with my dad. Now, was that food great? I'm not sure. It was a very long time ago, but I remember it really shaping. I thought I, you know, I remember being a kid and thinking that it was nice crust on the outside. They probably did the mustard crust on the outside, you know, the classic way that they used to that now Shake Shack or these other places do. Uh, and I was with my dad and I didn't dad, dad and I got to hang out for the day. It was just a very kind of cool experience. But then I also very vividly remember those flavors and I would have been six years old. So I, and I remember very little about being six. I was a musician for 10 years, uh, lived basically in a van, uh, traveling all over Canada and the United States uh, and the UK, and we did all of this kind of stuff. And, and it was amazing. And I, I, growing up on the East Coast, I grew up in kind of a meat and potatoes diet because that was before we had access to things like we do now on the East Coast, like great Syrian food and sushi and all, you know, curry and whatever. And I remember vividly having these food experiences as a musician, having a curry in London, England, when I was making a record there or a proper smoked meat sandwich in Montreal at Schwartz's. Uh, and I moved to Nashville uh, near the back end of that because my band said, let's give it one last go. Let's see if we can actually do this and make it happen. So we moved down there. I lived a very glamorous lifestyle in Nashville. I slept on an air mattress for two years and, uh, <laughs> and we, we roughed it and I wasn't taking care of myself at all. And a friend said, you should go to the library and borrow some cookbooks. You need to learn how to cook and start to take care of yourself. And I was like, you're crazy, man. The library doesn't have cookbooks. They do, of course. And, uh, and I brought them home and I borrowed, I, you know, I borrowed three cookbooks and I started working my way through them and just became obsessed with cooking and everything about food. I was making six or eight, sometimes 10 dishes a day for all of the studio mates and band mates and people who would normally eat alphagetti cold out of the can. I was cooking for those guys. And they loved it because they were getting a hot meal and they allowed me to kind of fail forward, I guess you'd say, on them. And, uh, and then just brought that home. And, and this exact same friend who suggested that I go to the library and borrow these cookbooks said, have you heard of Instagram? I think you'd like it. It's pretty cool. So I started an Instagram account and the, it was the most organic thing possible because the, my Instagram account grew into a food account only because that's the only content I had. Like literally the only photos on my phone were food photos and the odd photo of my wife. Food is soaked in nostalgia. It's just drenched in nostalgia for us. You know, if you asked, if you asked me why I, I spent a lot of time uh, making pizza because I love pizza and I love everything about it. And I would eat pizza for the rest of my life and be a very happy man, but I would still, so I feel like I'm pretty good at making pizza. I would still take my mom's pizza any day of the week. My mom's pizza came out of a box that she made that she overcooked, overcooked beef, overcooked, whatever. But it reminds me of being seven years old, eating with my family. It's just drenched in memory and nostalgia and food memory in a way that is universally unique. On Saturday mornings, listening to Motown, if I'm, you know, it feels like Saturday morning, like there's fried eggs and bacon going on and every, like just feet, second cup of coffee, brunch time. It feels like that to me, whereas that wouldn't be the same. On Thursday night, on date night, as an example, Nice bottle of red wine, some nice pasta. It's a, if it's a different thing, you know, you're listening to Chet, like Chet Baker or something very kind of jazzy, New York, you know, in a, in a jazz bar with a Manhattan in your hand, that kind of vibe. It's, I feel like music really sets the mood. That's why restaurants spend so much time curating their playlist. I did that when I wrote the cookbook. I, I wanted, I intentionally listened to certain music for certain chapters because one was a breakfast chapter. I was very intentional about that. I was intentional about when I shot that too because I wanted the light to look a certain way and it to feel like the morning time. I think that food go, you know, and specifically food photography goes way beyond just the food on the plate. You know, there's so many other elements to be considered. 
I believe in this thing called food and com uh, what I, I call it is the collision of food and community at the table. But it's this idea that if somebody moves from the couch to the kitchen, they move to the table and that's where real connection happens. That's where community happens. That's where we have real life conversations. It's where division starts to go away. It's when we realize how similar we are, not how different we are. It goes so much further than food. And I think that if I can inspire people to want to cook, inherently they'll move to the table. And I feel like just societally, we need more time at the table. Thank you.